Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. It's Corey Folsom O'Keefe, and I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar um, on making the most of your Audubon forest bird habitat assessment. Now, um, today's webinar is part of the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project. Uh, the Lime Forest Block is an important bird area that includes the towns of Colchester, East Haddam, uh, Lime, Old Lime, East Lime. And that important bird area is uh, particularly important to wood thrush, cerulean warbler, and a variety of other woodland nesting birds. Via presentations, bird walks, workshops, and demonstrations, um, the Lime Forest Black Conservation Project has engaged hundreds of people who live within or visit the important bird area about birds and their habitats and what we can do to improve habitats for birds in our own backyards and at local nature preserves. As a second phase of that project, we offered habitat assessments to private landowners and land trusts within the IBA. This morning's webinar is a final part of that project but rather than in just invite landowners from, from within the Lime Forest Block to open up this uh, webinar to all landowners and land trusts that have received Audubon Forest Bird Habitat Assessments. Good morning, Neil. Over the last five years. If everybody- oh, we're okay, how are you? That would be great. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. I'm just gonna mute everybody for now. Yeah. There we go. Um, this morning, we are going to be hearing from forester Eric Hansen of Ferrucci and Willicky LLC. Eric has been doing forest bird habitat assessments with Audubon since, I think, 2014. And um, today, he's going to be sharing his knowledge on invasives. He'll start with an invasive plant ID and then touch on invasive insects and then go into the treatment of invasives. Managing invasive plants is not easy, but it can be done. And Eric will illustrate this by using some case studies. Just a few things before we get started. Um, if you have a question during the presentation, you can go ahead and write it in the chat box. If you move your mouse over the bottom of the screen, um, this, this toolbar will pop up and there's the chat box right there. You can click that and uh, a space will open where you can write a question. Um, and uh, Kelly, uh, who's our Lime Forest Block assistant, and I will do the best to answer questions in the chat. Um, but if it's a question that we really need Eric to answer, uh, he is going to uh, take a pause in his presentation twice during the presentation. And uh, during that time, we'll uh, make sure that he has a chance to address questions that are in the chat. And also, during those breaks, you can uh, use the reaction button to, to sort of raise your hand. And that'd be another way that we know you want to ask a question directly of Eric. Uh, just a few other things to, to know about using um, Zoom. Uh, most of us have used Zoom quite a lot over the last uh, year, um, but you know there might still be some people out there who are new to using Zoom. Uh, at the top of your screen, you'll see the words view option. Um, and if you click on that, uh, under the heading, you'll see a button that says hide video panel. And that will uh, basically make sure that, you know, you, none of, nobody's images are blocking the, the view of the sort of PowerPoint. Um, or another option you can click is side-by-side -side mode, which means that you'll just see, um, you know, the, the views of, of the boxes with people in them will be to one side, the presentation will be to the other. Again, it won't block your view. Um, you can also go back and forth between grid view or just the speaker view, um, and you can enter and exit full screen mode. So just a few little controls for, for using Zoom. Uh, lastly, um, I, I, one thing I do want to let people know this webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you have to step away for a few minutes, um, I will be sending, you know, the recordings out to everybody uh, following the presentation. Um, and lastly, uh, I want to just give a shout out to all of our Lime Forest Black Conservation Project partners and supporters. Um, you know, this project was a group effort and we would not be able to do this work without the help of all of these other organizations. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Eric Hansen. Thank you, Corey. And let's see, I'm going to try to figure out how to share my screen. Okay, is that it? Mm -hmm. Share this one. Yeah. Okay.
I saw your screen for a minute there, Eric, but now I'm not seeing it again. Yeah, it'll come back. Okay. Almost there. Okay. There we go. You're good. Did it. Um, so uh, welcome everybody on this beautiful spring day and thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, this might go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Um, these things are way better when done in person and even better than that done in the woods. But uh, these are the ways that we're doing things right now. Um, so I am hopeful that uh, I have included enough information within the context of these slides, including pictures and descriptions and the words that I'll say uh, to help people understand um, a little bit about what goes on here today. And I realize uh, based on a discussion uh, with Corey about the potential participants, that there is a pretty wide range of experience level uh, within people who are listening today. So my hope is that everybody who's here gets a little something out of it, uh, or maybe more than a little something. Um, so as Corey mentioned, uh, these are going to be the main topics that we're going to be talking about today, not necessarily um, exactly in this order. We may jump around a little bit, but uh, I want to make sure everybody uh, can uh, is able to identify some of the major invasive plants, trying to figure out how to um, plan uh, a plan of attack to, to deal with invasives, implementing that plan, a couple of case studies and then give you some uh, potential resources uh, for you to be able to uh, think about on your, uh, on your own properties. Um, so before we get into plants, just really quickly, because we're talking about invasives, I wanted to um, introduce you, uh, or perhaps, um, what's the word, um, re-familiarize you with some of the um, the common inv invasive insect pests that we experience, we are experiencing here in Connecticut. Um, so, um, on the on the left here, when I move my mouse, can you see that, Corey? Yes. Okay. Uh, so on the left here is these white cottony things. That's hemlock woolly adelgid. In the middle. This is a very telltale sign of uh, woodpeckers pecking off the outer bark of ash to create this blonding uh, when they're looking for the larvae of emerald ash borer. And this is something that's been very common over the last five years or so in um, central and eastern Connecticut. That's a gypsy moth egg mass. Uh, all three of these uh, invasive insect plant, in, invasive insect pests have had major impacts on the species that they uh, interact with, and that in turn has major impacts on our forests. Um, and I'm not going to get into uh, too much about what that is today. Um, I can answer questions later if people have them, but um, uh, because there are impacts on forests, that means there are impacts on birds, uh, and they're different for each one of these species, but they are all important. Um, okay, so. Another thing that I usually like to try to do during um, presentations is, is actually interact with the audience. Because we're not gonna be able to uh, really do that, I'm gonna be doing a little bit more talking than normal. And I try not to read my slides, but this one I'm gonna read out loud um, just so you can hear me say it. So uh, according to the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group, which is uh, one of the preeminent um, uh, sources of information here in Connecticut about uh, what are invasive plants and how to treat them. An invasive plant is a non-native plant that is disruptive in a way that causes environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. Um, it's really important uh, to know that not all uh, non-native plants are invasive and um, uh, in fact, some non-native plants like clover and apple uh, have become very important to 
um, portions of our ecology. And I read this just to set the stage for what is an invasive plant. So uh, in addition to those features, um, some uh, uh, really common characteristics of uh, invasive plants are uh, that they leaf out earlier and they frequently keep their leaves longer. That extends the growing season for them and, and um, makes them uh, competitively uh, more advantageous than many of our native species. They're often fast growing. Um, they uh, usually, most invasives uh, sprout from the base, either root suckering or from the base when they're cut. Uh, they often uh, are not palatable to deer. Uh, they are usually prolific in terms of the amount of seed they produce, and they are really good at growing in lots of different conditions, which again, um, all these factors combined frequently makes them uh, able to um, outcompete our native species. Um, so to put this into context, um, why we care about this, uh, and just to um, let you know, these, these um, uh, bullet points here aren't necessarily in uh, order of importance, except for this top one. Uh, reduction in biodiversity. That is the, the single greatest impact, negative impact that uh, invasive plants have because they tend to grow in monocultures and because they can outcompete our native species for all the um, reasons that we uh, just talked about. Uh, overall, their presence frequently leads to a reduction in the amount of biodiversity, which we'll get into later in terms of why that's important may seem obvious, but we'll talk about it. Um, because they are non-native, they did not evolve here with the same um, interactions with um, pollinators, caterpillars, uh, other insects, and other wildlife that our native species do. So frequently there are fewer um, uh, caterpillars and uh, other species that use invasive as a host plant which results in a reduction in productivity, particularly uh, of interest to, to birds since uh, caterpillars are such a heavy, um, uh, heavily used food source for them. Some invasive plants can change ecological functions, specifically uh, I'm thinking about uh, garlic mustard, which is uh, frequently a woodland invasive. Uh, some of you um, may have that on your properties. Uh, they are allelopathic and they can actually change the chemistry of the, the soil that they grow in. Um, barberry has a very strong association with um, black-legged ticks, which are the um, uh, vectors of Lyme disease. Um, if you've ever tried to walk through a field of multiflora rose, you know what I'm talking about with this next one, increased difficulty of mobility and access. Um, and for a landowner, having uh, such a, uh, an area on your property really reduces the ability of, of you to, to use it. Um, once invasives become established, they're really difficult to get rid of, and, and that can uh, lead to a reduction in the uh, resilience of, um, uh, of a landscape because it can't uh, regenerate itself with the native species. Uh, that would normally be growing there, water quality issues, and um, I am sure there are more. <clears throat> In order to be um, balanced, uh, I want to um, throw it out there that there are not, uh, you know, not all features of invasive plants are all negative. Uh, there are some positives. Um, I'll go back to multiflora rose. There's a lot of uh, species that um, uh, will preferentially use multiflora rose because of the cover that it provides. Um, uh, many wildlife biologists um, will tell you that uh, New England cottontail uh, is a will preferentially use rose. And Corey, I think you mentioned um, the other day indigo bunting. Yep, at the uh, Bent of the River Audubon Center. Um, one year I had a field technician um, looking for um, early successional bird species nests, and he pretty much found, I think he found like 12 indigo bunting nests, and they were all in multiflora rose. 
Right. So, um, so in terms of cover and nesting areas, uh, they do provide uh, some um, some benefits. Uh, there is mast, and uh, many of you probably know this already, but we're going to be using this term a lot today. Uh, so just to uh, clarify, mast is just a fancy word for wildlife food. It comes in hard and soft forms. Hard mast is actually physically hard, like an acorn or a beech nut or a hickory nut. Um, soft mast is soft, like a cherry or a blueberry, raspberry, huckleberry, things like this. So invasive plants do provide mast and seed. Uh, frequently, they are um, less beneficial than our native species. Some people think that they are, some of the invasive plants are really pretty, particularly the um, uh, red versions of barberry and uh, burning bush in the fall. And uh, smell is one that I thought of uh, when I was putting this presentation together. For me, multiflora rose and olive smell really nice. Um, and there's probably others. So anyway, uh, on balance, I want to make it clear uh, when I say this, on balance, it's still better to have uh, native species, both ecologically uh, and for resilience purposes. Um, uh, so I, I put this slide in here as a reminder of where the invasives that we're going to be talking about today typically grow, uh, which is an understory. And to put that into context, understory is ground level to five foot above the ground and midstory, which is five foot to about 30 foot. Um, it's in the lower part of the midstory and in the understory that we're going to be focusing on for most of these invasives today. And these are the primary reasons that uh, that layer of the forest are important to uh, birds and other wildlife. So of all the invasives that we're going to be, uh, that are in our woods, uh, these are the five primarily that we're going to be talking about today. Barberry, rose, bittersweet, stilt grass, and garlic mustard. Um, the reason we're going to be focusing on these is they are the most uh, frequently uh, encountered and uh, they are also uh, typically the ones that have the greatest uh, impact. Um, starting with barberry, uh, there's hopefully um, you can all see these clearly enough, uh, but these pictures show uh, pretty well a lot of the feet, the important features of being able to identify a barberry. Um, the, the particular barberry that I'm talking about right now is Japanese and uh, it's typically got a lot of little leaves. They come in whirls around the stem. Uh, they have these tiny little barbs, which are, are really not very fun to walk through. They are extremely prolific in terms of their seeding. They grow really densely and they grow in a lot of different conditions. Um, they do particularly well when soils are uh, moist and good quality, um, meaning that they have um, higher nutrients uh, and they are really good at competing. They can, they can regenerate through seed, through sprouting, and they can actually walk. Uh, they can regenerate through a process called layering, which uh, not to get too far off topic, but layering is when a branch comes down, hits the ground, that branch can actually form roots and then go again. I don't know if you can see me through my camera or not, but I'm doing a bunch of arm things. Um, and uh, so it can actually walk like that and a new plant can um, keep growing. One of the, besides the uh, um, reduction in biodiversity that uh, very dense barberry stands will usually create, um, there is a, as I mentioned before, an association with ticks. Uh, I got this information from Scott Williams at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station just yesterday. This is the most up-to-date information that they have. Uh, and this is Connecticut specific, but barberry stands, uh, meaning dense understory barberry had 120 Lyme disease infected ticks per acre. Stands without barberry, 10 infected 
ticks per acre and managed barberry stands, they were able to reduce after three years by 60%. Um, the reason that this is important is uh, for human health. Many of you, I saw a lot of names that I recognize on the um, uh, participant list today. Uh, and I remember from visiting your properties that a lot of you like to be out on the property. So having substantial amounts of barberry actually is a human uh, is a risk to, to human health because of the tick associations. Um, moving on to multiflora rose. Um, multiflora rose is uh, perhaps my least favorite plant only because I've had to walk through it uh, enough times to tell me that that is the case. Uh, there's a couple of important features that I wanted to point out here. Uh, one is this, that it, it grows really densely. Again, in terms of potential cover, it can be really good. In terms of um, uh, getting through and allowing anything else to regenerate underneath it, not a so good. Uh, these are rose hips, um, which uh, can act as a form of mast, which is a double-edged sword because the uh, birds and other wildlife that eat them uh, will get some nutritional value, likely, uh, but they also end up uh, spreading them. Um, through their poop afterwards. Um, again, tiny little leaves on rose and rose got here because of um, uh, intentional plantings. And it wasn't that long ago that the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which um, now helps landowners try to get rid of this stuff, was advertising rose, multiflora rose, as a living fence to farmers um, to be planted in between pastures to keep your cows from going from one place to another. And it works, but it escaped. Um, here is a close up of what the leaves look like. Here is what the uh, barbs look like. And again, it's not very fun to walk through. Uh, this was a picture that I took a couple of winters ago of. Um, rose hips that had hung on into winter, and I like it. The picture, not the rose hips. Um, this plant is Asiatic bittersweet, and hopefully most of you don't have experience with this plant um, with uh, your properties, but uh, if you do, you will understand why this is such a big deal. It's, again, very prolific. The seeds themselves are, are really pretty, and uh, I have seen people selling these uh, to put on your doors and whatever else uh, in order to um, uh, beautify uh, areas uh, on your house and other places. Uh, the leaves are um, commonly uh, single and alternate on a, on a stem. Uh, this is a young version. And um, these are what the roots look like. So if you have something that you think might be bittersweet, the good news is it's relatively easy to pull and it's got this very characteristic orange uh, fibrous root system. Um, one of the bad news uh, pieces about bittersweet is it can get out of control really fast. Um, and uh, this on the right here, is very uh, typical of populations that have been left uh, to their own devices for uh, some time. And this is bittersweet on bittersweet with bittersweet vines everywhere. And they can get up into trees and not only can they break trees, but they can also act as, a, um, uh, as an impediment to the leaves. They cover the leaves, the leaves can die, and then they get so heavy that they can actually break the tops of the trees. So not a good plant to have around for a variety of reasons. Japanese stilt grass. Um, these are uh, from two different properties. And again, um, stilt grass ha has some aesthetic appeal. Uh, if you didn't necessarily know any better and up until a few years ago, I didn't. Uh, but seeing this grass here in this picture on the right, it's you know got a nice looking texture. It's um, nice color. It's very uniform in terms of its ability to colonize an area. So it can look nice, but um, it is extremely aggressive. Most of the time when I've seen it, it's been um, either in roads or right next to roads. Um, 
But if you happen to not know that you have a population there and you run equipment on that road, oh, my battery is running low, so I'm gonna plug in. Hold on. Whew. Did it. Okay. Uh, where was I? Uh, still grass. So it's either in the road or right next to the road. And if you run equipment through it, and if you happen to go into the woods from there, uh, you run the risk of spreading it into the woods. Again, it's uh, very difficult to get rid of. Um, once you get it and it grows in dense enough patches that very little, if anything, can uh, regenerate um, through it. Garlic mustard is the last uh, one we're gonna talk about in, in earnest this morning. Um, I got both of these pictures yesterday from uh, uh, vtinvasives.org, which is a site that we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, uh, it does occur in Connecticut. It's a, a what do they call it? Um, a bian biennial plant. I think they, I think that's what they call it. If anybody else knows, you can put it in the chat to correct me. Um, but uh, biannual, something like this. Anyway, this on the right is the um, first year it grows in a rosette, and you can actually use these um, uh, to uh, cook with or put them in uh, salads, and they don't taste terrible. Uh, this is what it looks like in the second year, and all these little frilly things uh, are just full of seeds, and when you walk through them, they go everywhere. Um, this is the plant that I was talking about before, that once it becomes established, um, can uh, change the uh, soil chemistry, and it is allelopathic. And for those of you who don't know what that word means, allelopathic means uh, a, a, a plant that produces a chemical that inhibits the growth of other plants. Uh, other examples of allelopathic vegetation include um, black walnut. That's another uh, allelopathic um, thing. Um, so uh, we're gonna pause for questions in, in just a, a minute here, but before we do that, I wanted to just point out that there are some native species that sometimes people label as invasive that can actually be important for um, birds and other wildlife. And um, they include, uh, and I know, uh, I think Eileen talked about some of this last week for those of you who were there, uh, but they include grapevine. Uh, and grapevine can, similar to um, bittersweet, grapevine can uh, topple uh, young trees, but it does so much less frequently and it's a much less aggressive competitor. Uh, here's the leaf. Here's the, here's the wild grape. Uh, and this is what the, um, uh, the bark of the grapevine looks like. Uh, Eileen probably mentioned this, but just to reiterate, um, there are several species that use the strips of the bark for nesting material. Poison ivy uh, and um, Virginia creeper actually are two uh, other um, vines that are basically native at this point. Uh, and uh, poison ivy especially does not typically harm the tree. Uh, it is this one on the side, uh, this hairy thing. Um, and if uh, Eileen didn't mention it to you last week, and even if she did, I'm going to say it again. Um, th there is a rhyme that I heard about once upon a time that has really helped uh, me to try to get the point across to people not to touch this. And it's uh, don't be a dope and touch the hairy rope. Uh, which is this thing. It's got these really fine fibrous roots uh, growing right off the side of it. And uh, here's a really interesting comparison. Virginia creeper, which I mentioned a second ago, has five leaves and looks very similar to poison ivy, which has one, two, three leaves. So here's the poison ivy vine. Here's the Virginia creeper vine. Uh, and again, poison ivy and Virginia creeper. Um, rubus, and uh, by rubus, I mean uh, blackberry and raspberry primarily. 
um, but they are sometimes considered invasive by people, but they are, they are native and they are usually very beneficial uh, for a variety of reasons, including for pollinators and for um, uh, cover and their mast. This is what the leaf looks like close up. So somewhat similar to rose, but um, they are native. And the last one that I'll talk about is green briar. Uh, or cat briar, uh, which are two separate species, but we'll just call them briar for now. Um, they can act like an invasive at times. You can see just how densely this patch of briar is, is growing. Um, uh, this is what the leaf looks like close up and similar to some of the other vines that we've seen, they do have these barbs on them uh, that make it difficult to, to walk through. Okay. So that is uh, the end of section one. Um, and these are some birds. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask about anything at this point? All clear? Is there anything in the chat, Corey? There is not anything in the chat, so. Um, okay. I would say that unless somebody unmutes himself right now and asks a question, I think you're probably good to continue. Okay, everybody good? Um, so uh, I will ask I will ask one question, and that is in terms of the one of the first things that we talked about, which were either the uh, impacts or the um, uh, potential benefits. Was there anything that uh, anybody has seen? Um, that I missed, that we were, uh, that were that weren't on the list in either of those two things. When it comes to invasives, I thought yeah. you had a pretty thorough list there, Eric. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so assuming that I. Uh, you either knew this stuff coming in, or uh, I told you enough about this stuff just now so that you have a, a slightly better sense of what you're looking for. Once you're able to see what it is that you have, um, these are uh, what we need to do, what you would need, some of what you would need to do moving forward in terms of what do you do uh, with and for and to invasive plants. So the first thing is you need to be able to identify them. Um, where are they on the property that you're managing? How much is there on the property that you're managing? And um, what are your resources? How can you get help? Excuse me. Um, I've mentioned the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, a couple of times now, and um, NRCS is the acronym for that. They are a branch of the USDA, and um, they do a lot of uh, technical, they provide a lot of technical advice for landowners, and they also provide a lot of um, financial incentive for landowners to uh, actively manage their properties. Um, and one of the primary things that they help with is the treatment of uh, invasive plants, uh, which if people are interested, we can get into the um, technical aspects of that later. I won't talk about that right now, but the big, um, the big four things that I want to uh, talk with you about uh, right now to start off with are uh, the identification, uh, developing a plan, attempting, if you can, to coordinate with your neighbors and don't bite off more than you can chew. And this fourth one might sound easy and obvious, but it's a really important one because this is a long-term multi-year uh, endeavor for most people. Um, and it's really important that you don't burn yourself out at the beginning um, and that you are able to uh, incorporate the management of the invasives into other stuff that you do with the property. In addition to that, it's also really important to be able to do this, uh, especially when you have larger infestations, to do it using a phased approach. And 
um, besides the not biting off more than you can chew and making sure that you can actually still do stuff after one season. Um, another primary reason for um, using the phased approach is because you don't necessarily want to get rid of all the invasives all at once for all the potential positives that they provide, whether it's the cover or the potential mast, um, you know, some of the utility for pollinators, all those things. Because if, if those go away all of a sudden, then uh, the utility of your property uh, gets reduced. The utility of your property for birds and other wildlife can potentially be reduced. Uh, there are operational reasons for wanting to do it all at once. And if you, if you can, it's probably okay. Um, knowing that there's going to be a potential lag time between uh, when you get rid of the invasives and when either native plants uh, take over or plantings that you do afterwards can become established. Uh, so hopefully that's clear. Once you are able to um, start to control them, uh, your job isn't done as a manager. Uh, monitoring, retreatment, replanting in places where it's reasonable and uh, expansion of efforts uh, is, is really important. And um, the documentation part, number five here, uh, that I, I have frequently uh, heard from landowners that it is really useful for them to be able to look back at um, uh, what they had and what they accomplished. Um, Plus, uh, somebody can use it in their PowerPoint someday, which I have today. Um, so it, uh, after you are able to ID them, um, getting a, uh, a decent map together of where they are and what you got is really important. This is just an example of a, um, of a map that I had created not that long ago for some invasive plants on a property that I helped manage. Um, and you can see in the, in the key here, these are all the different invasives on the property and you can see where there are hot spots uh, and, where, and where there are just kind of uh, individuals here and there. Um, as you can see, interestingly enough, uh, most of the populations are associated with the uh, trails or old roads, uh, which is a fairly common condition. And that's not to say, I wanna make it clear, that's not to say you need anything this fancy, and not that this is this fancy, but you don't need anything this fancy, I'll use that word, to, uh, um, to do your planning. Um, it just helps to have uh, something that you can refer to in, in terms of location. You don't necessarily have to uh, look at all these words, um, but this is an example of a uh, plan that I had developed for a property uh, for a land trust that I was working with. Um, and this was my attempt to uh, help them do things in a phased approach so that they did not uh, get overwhelmed um, by the prospect of doing things all at once. So you can see here how I spread out the years, treating the southern third for two years, middle third for two years, northern third for two years with follow-ups. Um, ideally, um, limited, you know, more limited every year amounts of follow-ups as they, as they treated. Um, by the time they, if they stuck to the schedule, by the time they finished the northern third, and to put it into context, this stand is uh, maybe 12 acres, so it's not very big um, in terms of uh, many other forest stands. Um, so by the time they finish with the northern third, the southern third will have started to um, revegetate already, ideally with native species, because they're going back every year and uh, monitoring and retreating. Okay. So um, one of the things that I mentioned before, uh, which I'll, I'll mention again before I get into the actual treatment methods, is uh, working with neighbors. And uh, for those of you who don't necessarily understand what I'm talking about, I'll try to put this into context. If, um, if you have uh, a property that has uh, a, an understory full of barberry, your neighbor, just the other side of the stone wall, has a property 
property that's full of barberry in the understory. You can treat your uh, property as extensively as you want, but if you don't work cooperatively and collaboratively with that person, um, it is highly likely that uh, the seed source that's right there is going to reinfest um, uh, your property, unfortunately. So uh, as often as possible, attempting to uh, manage across boundaries uh, really does have utility. Um, so in terms of uh, actual treatment methods, um, we are gonna be talking about um, mechanical treatment methods, chemical treatment methods, and um, what is frequently the most effective, uh, which is a combination of those methods. There is a lot, uh, there are a lot of people who don't really feel comfortable with this uh, chemical uh, piece of things, which um, I understand. Uh, I really don't love the idea of uh, putting chemicals <clears throat> on the land because I don't know what happens to those chemicals. I know what the chemical companies tell me happens, but I'm not really sure what actually happens. Um, uh, what I can say is I've seen uh, their use uh, be very effective in uh, achieving the goal of controlling invasive plants and allowing natives to become established afterwards. Um, and here are a couple of uh, case studies that we will be uh, looking at to um, help us understand. Uh, and, and I have some pictures actually that um, uh, Carol Lambiers from the Bethany Land Trust sent me uh, about this. Um, I want to reiterate um, that this has been a multi-year approach for them. At the beginning, they had a, um, uh, a, an extremely substantial uh, understory full of barberry, and it was overwhelming to them to think about trying to get in. So they hired somebody at first to help uh, cut them. And then later in the season, once those barberry uh, sprouted, they uh, put herbicide down on the sprouts later in that season. Um, every year after that, volunteers uh, put in dozens of hours of work per person. Uh, when I say dozens, I mean like 70 or 80 hours per person uh, per growing season to pull them. So this is that combination that I was talking about of um, mechanical and chemical controls. Uh, and over time, they have gotten good control. There was some concern that they had uh, for a variety of reasons about <clears throat> leaving the bare ground. So one of the things that they tried to do, and I think it was successful, was to um, plant some native species, which they put uh, deer fencing around because there are very high deer populations there. Um, one of the things that Carol mentioned to me uh, that has happened since, which has really increased their, uh, the difficulty of uh, managing the invasives moving forward is the amount of dead trees uh, and down trees in that area. Uh, because it's a relatively good quality site, there were a fair amount of ash on the site, which are, are now uh, dying from emerald ash borer because it is infested uh, there. And those trees that have fallen have created um, uh, tripping hazards and just make uh, the ability to get around much more difficult. In addition, uh, there's been some major storms that have come through that area and put some trees on the ground, which again, increases the relative level of difficulty. Um, so, well, you can see my cursor. Uh, but these two pictures were in, I think, 2014, uh, and these are the befores. So you can see underneath these trees, it is just a sea of barberry. Uh, this was the first cutting. They did it with a, a brush saw, and you can see based on the amount of rocks that there's no way that they could get in with another type of machine to do that mechanical cutting. So it had to be by hand, and it had to be, uh, you know, single people, well, I mean, it could have been married, I guess, but uh, anyway, uh, one person at a time and um, uh, cutting these down and then the sprouts was what they sprayed later in the season. Uh, and this actually uh, was what it looked like uh, immediately afterwards. And so um, 
huge difference. This is what it's this is what it was like two months after the initial treatment um, and after uh, a first spray. Um, this is another kind of treatment, um, and I want to be clear when I say this, that this is the target area for the reduction in vegetation. Um, this was a mixture of native and non-native species. Uh, this in here was mostly non-native. Uh, you can see some of the bittersweet vines creeping into here. Um, this is a combination of native and non-native, but for a variety of reasons, they needed um, uh, this this taken care of, and you can maybe see it here in the distance, but this is a brontosaurus. And for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that uh, particular piece of equipment, it's crazy. It's a crazy thing to uh, look at and watch. But basically, this, this thing has an uh, excavator body and boom with a head and rotating teeth on it. Uh, and it can just chew down a tree from the top down. Um, the reason the, this contractor decided to go um, with that piece of equipment here is because there was a lot of unknowns in terms of the, the ground. He also had access to uh, a FECON forestry mower, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but because of wetness and rocks, he decided to use this. So uh, pretty dramatic uh, in terms of before and after. Um, and the plan here was to uh, monitor, treat invasives as they came back and then let the area come back to natives and then get on a mowing schedule of about every five years or so um, with a FECON. Um, for any of you who aren't familiar with what a FECON uh, forestry mower is, I don't have a picture of it here, but uh, it is, uh, they come in different sizes, but frequently it is uh, an attachment that's put on to a relatively small, small piece of equipment, either a farm tractor or like a bobcat. And it has rotating teeth on the front of it. So basically, as opposed to a brush hog, which frequently you'll drag behind, um, this piece of equipment you uh, chew in front of you. Uh, and it's one of the more effective mechanical treatments for uh, places that are out of control with uh, invasive plants. Um, this particular uh, set of pictures is from a property that has used a combination of mechanical and chemical treatments uh, with really good success. Um, the person on the right is standing in front of a pile that, that uh, she created in one day um, from uh, cut stems of burning bush on her property in a relatively small area. And that just is just to give you a sense of the ridiculous density of that invasive plant on her property. Um, the area on the left is showing Japanese barberry in the understory. And um, uh, part of the reason that I included this picture here is to um, reiterate to you that this time of year is a really good time to go out on your property to try to identify the invasive plants. Because as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, they usually leaf out before our native species so they can stick out like a sore thumb uh, and you can get a sense for uh, a really good sense for where they are. Uh, and this is just to give you a, another uh, indication of one of the places on this property where the barberry were. Um, so uh, you don't necessarily need to use all these words or need to read all these words, but to put it into context um, where that burning bush existed there was little to no, uh, nothing growing in the understory, not even sedge and grass. Uh, and there was very limited um, use of the area by birds. Um, this uh, woman and her partner used uh, the cut stump method of treatment, which again is a combination of mechanical and chemical treatments using a jaw saw, which I wish I had a picture of because that thing is ridiculous. It's kind of like a, uh, really scary set of uh, 
lopper on steroids um, uh, or an electric saw for those of you who don't feel like um, carting around a chainsaw and don't want the either the noise or the um, uh, exhaust associated with it. Uh, those electric chainsaws can work really well on um, some of the uh, smaller stems. Uh, and as soon as they were done uh, cutting the um, cutting the plants, they would immediately treat them with uh, a crossbow, which is a type of um, uh, it's a type of herbicide. And again, this is the cut stump method of application. If you're going to do that. Uh, you need to make sure to do it relatively quickly, like within an hour, two tops uh, of cutting the, the stem. And there are times of year that are better than others um, to do that. Uh, but uh, crossbow is tr uh, triclopyr based herbicide as opposed to glyphosate, which is your roundup and, and those kinds of things. The good news about triclopyr uh, is that it's woody plant specific. And so if you have herbaceous species or grasses or other things like this that aren't woody that you don't want to be targeted, triclopyr can um, work relatively well for that. Um, after they got relatively good control, after one treatment of this actually, uh, they have gone through with um, uh, a mowing or a weed whipper. Um, so they have transitioned again away from the herbicide to more mechanical treatments. Um, and you saw that giant pile of uh, um, uh, burning bush, which, which she made. <clears throat> there are a couple of different um, treatment methods that I want to um, uh, let you know about. One is a, kind of a very formal thing, um, and it's called the Buckthorn Blaster. Uh, which was created by uh, a company called Landscape Restoration based out of Minnesota. And this is an actual thing that you can go on the internet and buy, and you don't have to use it just for buckthorn, but it is really good. Uh, it's a really good application method for um, uh, the cut stump type of treatment. Um, this is an old uh, French's, uh, probably French's, I don't know that for sure, but it's an old mustard bottle uh, that the forester that's using this had uh, filled with an, an appropriate mix of herbicide. And this is what the cut stump uh, treatment looks like. He had just cut, uh, what was it? Maybe buckthorn um, and is applying this directly to the stump um, right after cutting it. One piece of advice that I would give is uh, when you're doing this, put some um, limited amount of dye in the whatever chemical mix you're using so that you know where you've been uh, and that you don't end up duplicating efforts. Uh, I want to reiterate that these two resources, the uh, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group and vtinvasives.org are both really uh, extremely useful I actually find the vtinvasives.org website a little bit um, more useful. And the reason for that is because they have really good uh, pictures for identification. And then they, uh, it's all in, internal within the website. Each invasive has its own page and they're all um, uniform in terms of their layout. Uh, but they talk about the different, the relative uh, effectiveness and very specific ways of treating invasives to uh, get um, uh, the best control. But SIPWIG is also good. Uh, also, there is the internet, uh, which uh, provides a lot of information and books and other things. Um, this is a picture uh, from Middletown, and you might not be able to see it on your computers, but uh, you can see here there's a lot of um, uh, gray topped trees, which are uh, gypsy moth killed trees uh, on the other side of the valley there. And that was all the talking I had planned on doing. Um, so if there are any thoughts, questions, whatever, I am happy to answer. And thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Eric. Um, there are maybe two questions in the chat that I'd love to get your thoughts on. Um, and uh, one of them, I, I can't think I answered, but uh, I want to just make sure I answered it correctly. Um, Rick had asked, uh, you know, if you cut barberry, you know, will it resprout? Um, and I think if as long, if you don't apply herbicides, so stump painting, then yes, it is likely to resprout. But it, if you cut it, can you continue to sort of cut it back year after, you know, after over a year or so, it will eventually use the energy up in the root system. Is that correct? Uh, so the, the short answer is yes, probably. There are better times a year um, to, to do that if you're not going to be able to pull it and get all the roots out. Um, more specifically, um, after leaf out in spring, but before it's had a lot of time to uh, replenish root reserves, uh, if you can cut it then and then repeatedly cut it throughout the growing season once it resprouts. But the short answer to your question is yes, it's going to resprout. And if you just have a couple of plants in your front yard or something that you're trying to get rid of, and for whatever reason you can't pull them, um, repeated cuttings may eventually exhaust reser root reserves. Okay. Um, there are other questions coming into the chat too. Um, uh, one person asked, uh, which herbicides work best early in the season? That's a really good question. Um, it depends. So the plants themselves are actually, uh, they respond better. And when I say better, um, not better for the plant, better for us who want to control them. Um, but they respond uh, differently and better to different herbicides. Uh, so ideally with, with most herbicides, uh, if it's, if it's going to be a uh, cut stump application, um, the, the fall is a really good time to do that because uh, at that time of year, they are translocating uh, back down to the roots. So in order to suppress their um, sprouting response, uh, if you kill the roots, it, that is a more successful uh, method. The same for a, a foliar application. If you can do it in late summer uh, or early fall before they start to um, lose their chlorophyll while they're still photosynthesizing, uh, they're going to start taking that down to the, to the roots. But um, realistically, if you can uh, get a, uh, if you can get a day during the growing season where the leaves are uh, out, if you're going to be doing a foliar application where the leaves are out, um, it's relatively dry, it's not too hot, and it's not too windy. Um, if it's an appropriate um, amount of application in terms of the actual chemical percentage, uh, an, inter an appropriate method of application, and that herbicide is effective on that plant, usually you can have impact, you know, at any point in time during the growing season. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay, another question was, um, this is from Beth, is there a benefit to simply cutting back vegetation to at least stop seed spread? Um, and she's thinking in particularly about porcelainberry and swallowwort. Uh, porcelainberry and swallowwort, I will be very honest and say that I have limited experience with those uh, and I don't know how they regenerate, but if you have a population that you're basically able to uh, keep where it is um, by continual cutting back and not allow it to spread, not allow it to um, produce seeds, then uh, that's probably okay if you want them there for some reason if you don't want to try to get rid of them. For, I'll just uh, quickly mention for a uh, horse or for swallowwort, we have some at um, our Stratford uh, Point uh, Sanctuary and um, it's not a huge amount. So thankfully it is, you know, sort of uh, something within reason to treat, but we've been using black tarp and putting black tarp over it um, and just sort of keeping that black tarp over it. Um, to basically sort of uh, kill it through like solarization. So that's one technique that we're using with black swallowwort at, at Stratford Point. Um, and I, I would say that I think, you know, for a lot of invasive plants, like if you can prevent them going to seed, 
um, you know, that, that definitely helps. Um, we also have mugwort at Stratford Point and um, it's a large enough quantity of mugwort that, you know, we're not sure how to, we have, we're trying, still trying to figure out how the best way to control it is. Um, but we are mowing it fairly actively to keep it from going to seed. Um, you know, we can't really control spreading by rhizomes, but we can at least stop it from going to seed by mowing it repeatedly. Um, and Mary, we've had the, the um, black tarps over the black swallow work for probably about a year and a half now, um, but I think it, it is slowly doing the trick. So it's, it's, it's kind of died in the areas in the center of the tarp. Um, along the edges, there's still a little bit of black swallow work, but um, I think, you know, we're probably about the point where we can take those tarps off and, and uh, kind of see what comes up naturally at this point. Eric, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. So um, one other question that was, um, that came up and uh, I'd love to get your input on this one is um, two people mentioned that, you mentioned that, um, that it's good to get your neighbor to sort of similarly be treating their invasives. Uh, but what if your neighbor is a state forest? Talk to them. Um, and, and if, uh, so they do, uh, state forests, um, frequently have uh, specific managers within DEP and part of the management that they do is to treat invasive plants. So especially if they know that you are um, uh, interested in collaborating and you're gonna be doing some treatment on your own, uh, that may uh, spur them into action to be able to, to do something. Um, I say that with the caveat that uh, if it's not in a management plan currently, it's likely not going to get done. And they are running a skeleton crew of, of people um, at DEP Forestry uh, right now. Uh, but the, the specific action item that I want you to take away from this if, is if, if you haven't done it yet, um, get in touch with your DEP Forester um, and have that conversation. And, and if, uh, I'll throw this out there, if, if you don't know how to do that, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with that person. Perfect, that was my question, <laughs> so. Okay, I think that's the, the bulk of the questions. Um, anybody else have a question they wanna ask? So um, Steve Penner asks, um, are there any other applicators for cut stumps? Any other applicators for cut stumps? Mm -hmm. Oh, like besides the buckthorn blaster and a mustard bottle? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of other things. Sometimes people just use a backpack uh, pump sprayer um, the bad news about that is that there could potentially be a little bit of overspray and unintended, um, uh, unintended kill. Uh, there's also, I mean, you can make your own um, uh, applicator that is like a, um, like a buckthorn blaster. Any bottle will do and put a, a sponge-like applicator on the top, uh, mix up the um, uh, the appropriate mix of whatever you want and, and apply it. To my knowledge, those two are the ones that, that people use, um, the, the buckthorn blaster and uh, mustard bottle, but there's all kinds of things out there that you can do. And uh, I would honestly email, uh, if, you, if you're really looking for more, I would email um, Sipwig and ask if they have any suggestions. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so other people can do stuff. Would a, uh, just use a paintbrush to uh, apply herbicide? Sometimes people do. Yep, that can work too. The bad news about that is you have to be carrying around hail or something of herbicide that's wide enough to get a, a paintbrush into. 
Uh, whereas any of those other options, if you happen to fall when you're carrying those things, the, the chemical isn't going to go everywhere. In case you're prone to falling. Eric, Beth asked is, uh, can cuttings be left on the site or should they be removed? Will oh. they re-sprout or simply compost? Great, great question. Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention was in terms of mechanical treatment specific to uh, garlic mustard, um, that one, uh, because of its life cycle in, and its uh, seed viability is much better to pull and bag and take off site. When you're, if you're gonna be doing cuttings, uh, if those cuttings are, um, of the species that, that we mentioned, and they are not, uh, they don't have seeds on them, just try to put them, uh, and, and if you're gonna leave them in the woods, try to leave them up on something like a, a rock or a branch so that, that no part of them is actually touching the, um, touching the ground. This is obviously much more important if there's any roots associated with, uh, uh, with the cuttings. Most actual just, cuttings won't be able to um, uh, won't be able to, to, to sprout and root but uh, if they have seeds attached to them then they potentially could and uh, especially if you've pulled them up um, try to either again put them on a rock or hang them upside down in a nearby tree so that their roots are up so that they can dry out and they can't re-root. Things like, um, things like Japanese knotweed, which we didn't talk about, that stuff is not good to leave on site. And if there's any way to, if you're cutting that stuff to, to bag it and take it away or burn it or, or something. Okay, any other questions? You can just unmute yourself and ask them at this point if you'd like. Okay, I think we are good. So um, I want to thank everybody for participating in our, our two part webinar series. I want to thank Eric for, for covering uh, invasives uh, today. And um, I, I did put Eric's uh, email address in the chat, you know, a few people asked for it. So, and it was on his last slide. So I figured that was okay. And, um, uh, you know, I think many of you have my email as well. So, um, you know, if you have questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but I want to thank you again, um, you know, for participating and, um, you know, thank you for, for, uh, you know, taking, you know, taking responsibility of your land and thinking about the best ways to manage it. And, and, um, you know, you guys, uh, you know, the forests that are owned by private landowners or, or land trusts in Connecticut are really important. And, and I, I want to thank you all for your efforts to, to manage your, your lands with birds in mind. Thank you. Second.